My idea in walking you through the input language of Klingo and Gringo is nonetheless to give you the concepts and illustrate these with some source code examples, right? So again, I will try to highlight this by using different fonts. And uh, I think it's better that you have the concepts actually than, than that we just work on the source code level, right? That's a bit the idea. Okay, so let's start small and keep in mind the smallest entity is not an atom, even though the word would suggest this. No, it's the subatomic structure and these are terms. As in real life, terms come in different types and sizes. So there are constant symbols, function symbols, numeral symbols, variable symbols. And then you can use parentheses to give arguments to function symbols. And in addition, there are tuples. And you can see tuples as um, actually as as if you would use a function symbol to compose different um, terms, but omit the function symbol ultimately, right? So you do, if you don't bother about using a function symbol and just want to group, group terms, use tuples. Okay, this is of course a bit picky. I use symbols all the, all the time. You, oh, well, let's say it's not correct because after all, these are just symbols. This is just syntax, but just to be not overly picky, I just drop these symbols and talk about constants, functions, numerals, even though these are actually the semantic entities, right? So this is a, a, a function and the function symbol is, is something else. A function symbol is the syntax and the function is something, well, it's, it's something abstract that uh, you have to define, that you have to give a semantics. Okay, anyway, functions are more or less the deal on how to construct from terms, other terms, and I think you know all that, right? And here are some examples, right? So here is a ternary function symbol. So a function symbol that takes three uh, arguments, uh, a numeral, a constant, and a variable. And keep in mind that variables always start with uppercase letters. And uh, well, constants and function symbols, uh, we, we start with lowercase letters. And I normally try to use F and G for functions and C and D for constants, right? And X and Y for variables or, or alike. And, and some are Arabic uh, numerals for, for numbers, right? Because after all, I could use Romans. It's just syntax. Well, zip it. Then there is a special variable, the anonymous variable. And this is actually used here as the second and the third argument. And the special thing about the anonymous variable is, even though the anonymous variable is used here and here, the values that you instantiate at each place are not synchronized. So because if you would use x and x here, then you would always instantiate the same term. With the anonymous variable, you say, oh, you don't care. And it's a bit like using different variables at, the, at, at, at these places. And it also has some, some other advantages, like the grounder can make uh, optimizations, but let's not go into detail. And here, last but not least, is an example with a tuple, right? I was bragging about this. So if you, if you are too lazy, like me, to add function symbols because they don't convey any meaning, you can just use tuples at that. Uh, at such positions, and that comes in handy from time to time. Okay, so these are the terms. So in the same way as we can create terms in that way, we can also have tuples of terms. And here I, I denote them by making the T boldface. You see this guy here is just, just a T, and this is a boldface T. Okay. So now that we have more or less cleared the subatomic structure, Let's go to the atomic structure and look at atoms. In general, atoms represent elementary relationships among objects. And objects are represented by terms, and we've just seen these guys. Now, to describe a relationship, you use, or we use, predicate symbols. And these are the guys like P and Q. And then we use parentheses to put in the object representatives, the terms. And then we have a tuple of terms to, to represent these objects. This is more or less an atom, right? Now you may wonder, ooh, why is there something like negated atom? What is this minus symbol? In fact, Klingo offers you also a strong type of negation where it's not like as usual with negation, unless something, some, some a negated literal is true, unless its atom was proven. Here the idea is you really want a proof for not A. You want to prove that A is false, right? And in fact, um, Semantically, as we will see later, you can treat these guys just as atoms and then just establish a relationship between them. Anyway, I zip it now. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, we will detail this in, a, in, a, in, a, in the next part. Okay, as before, we don't have to be overly picky and just 
but I just drop then this uh, qu uh, qualifier symbol and we talk about predicates. Okay, then here's some, some examples. So for instance, this is now a strongly negated uh, atom, which has predicate symbol P, and it has two arguments, this functional term and this other functional term. These are the two guys we've seen before in the terms. One particularity is that whenever we have no arguments, and so that we would here write something like an empty tuple, right? Uh, we just drop these opening and closing parentheses and write uh, Q. This is just like in propositional logic where we just have atoms and don't talk about a subatomic structure. Then there are also two particular, uh, so, so, to, so to speak, atoms which always have a constant truth value, true or false, and logically they are represented by the bottom and the top symbol, and in Gringo or Klingo they are represented by hash false and hash true. I guess you may already have seen that dedicated things for Klingo are always preceded with a hash. Okay, so this gives us atoms, and now we can check out literals. A literal is either an atom, or its negation, or its double negation. Double negation is again something you may not have come across uh, right now, but in ASP again we distinguish whether an atom is provably true or whether an atom is only true. And this is exactly the distinction we have here. So if you write an atom, then it means it's not enough that this guy is true, because a truth assignment tells you so. No, there also has to exist a proof. While for not not A, you don't need a proof. You just, this is just already true if, if the truth assignment says A is true, and then not not A is true. So for the logicians among you, you may actually notice that the language which, which, where everything is behind a negation, this is actually um, classical logic and you can more or less do open world reasoning with this. Because this is exactly what happens here. You treat the atom A under open world reasoning. Good. So these are just the literals. Here is an example. So you have an atom, you have a single negated atom, and you have the same guy, double negated. And of course, think about safety. safety is a property you need for grounding. This always works over positive literals in the body. So these guys are not positive in this sense of, or in the sense of safety. Okay, another particular kind of uh, literals are arithmetic literals. And here you have terms, maybe arbitrary terms, uh, and this is a comparison symbol here. And so this gives you an arithmetic literal. Importantly, all terms, numbers, constants, uh, functional terms, all ground terms are totally ordered in Gringo. So you can always take a term and another term and compare them and you get a result whether one is larger than the other one. This is actually very handy when it comes to modeling, that this is defined, right? So here's an example. You can write 3 smaller than 1 or f of 42 equals x. So these are more or less, uh, say, the, the most primitive uh, literals. Now let's look at something more complicated and we revisit conditional literals briefly. Well, after all, you've seen conditional literals already at several occasions, so that should be pretty straightforward. So conditional literal is a literal subject to a tuple of symbolic or arithmetic literals. So the bold phase L is, if you like, a tuple that represents a conjunction of literals. And again, L can be L itself can be symbolic or arithmetic, and the same actually for the guys in the in the conjunction or in the tuple. So here is an abbreviation. So whenever this tuple here is empty, you you also drop the colon and you just write the whole thingy here uh, as L. Well, so more or less, you can you can, conditional literals degenerate to ordinary literals whenever there are no conditions. So. Okay, good. So here's now the example that I was already expecting. So here's a, an easy one, the type we've already seen. So P of X, Y, if Q of X and R of Y. So keep in mind that one way of reading this actually is an implication. So this guy holds if these guys here hold, and this is a conjunction. The special case where there are no conditions is simply a, a literal, here a positive one. And again, you can also use false and true. And sometimes this makes modeling perhaps harder to read, but sometimes more, more compact by writing implications. So if Q holds, then false. If you write this in the body, this may knock out uh, a rule. Okay, anyway, these are 
conditional literals, something you already knew pretty, pretty well. And now let's get a bit more picky and look at how aggregates are exactly dealt with. No. Okay. Aggregate atoms. So in general, aggregate atoms have this form here, where the alpha here is an aggregate name, like sum or count. And then we have uh, these uh, conditional literals, where somehow the t here is a tuple. And not strictly speaking a literal, but a conditional uh, term tuple, right? So this is a term tuple, this is a literal tuple, and we have several of them. And then we have uh, comparison symbols, here and here, and they may actually be different. And finally, we have terms as one, as two, as both, as both ends to re represent the bounds. Okay, so actually, both bounds uh, can be omitted, right? You may actually uh, omit this guy or this guy or even both. If you omit both, then things degenerate normally to in a, in a count to to an unrestricted count, right? Um, and Whenever you just omit the, the comparison symbol, that is, you omit these guys, but you leave the bounds. And we have seen this with early cardinality constraints, right? Where we said at least two and at most seven, right? Then uh, the comparisons default to smaller or equal. So that's actually pretty handy when you, when you program. So whenever you don't write anything smaller or equal is taken, and that's, that's actually pretty natural. So here's an example, right? You can write, uh, 10 is smaller or equal than the sum um, of, of the term tuples, smaller or equal than 20. And again, here the idea is uh, those term tuples remain where the condition is true in the current stable model candidate. And then the sum is built over the first element of the tuple, right? So over the six, in case the six is in, six is counted, in case this guy's in the three is counted, right? But not the remaining ones. And that's actually an important trick to remember for, for, for using these aggregates. Now, um, that's more or less the same thing. You just more or less can omit uh, the comparison symbols. And this then defaults to what we've seen before, right? Um, okay, and in the same way as you can form literals from atoms above, you can also form uh, aggregate literals by negating them once or twice. Here's for instance a negated one where you just write a not before what we've seen before. And uh, then literals as such are either conditional or aggregate literals. And keep in mind that the special case of conditional literals is the one where there is no condition and hence just basic literals uh, or symbolic literals or arithmetic literals are also included in, in the, among conditional literals. So this is roughly actually what uh, terms and literals are about. And again, for a detailed account on these guys, consult the Potasco's user's guide, which you find at potasco.org. Okay, so uh, hope you like this walkthrough. Now let's get uh, going a little bit on, on more complex structures and see how shorthands work, in particular on aggregates.